If you're familiar with all things Azure Private Link DNS, you're a seasoned network architect who's worked with Azure for a long time, feel free to skip this preamble, go straight to the technical demo. However, if you're newer to Private Link, newer to Azure, perhaps you're not a network focused architect, then let's try and tee this up as succinctly as possible. In recent videos, you've seen me use this diagram to agree on the basics of Private Link. We've talked about how you use a private endpoint in the VNet, it's a NIC, it's got a private IP, and then when you enter that NIC, you ride the private link escalator, and on the top, you pop out into a PaaS service, such as Azure Storage, Azure SQL, Key Vault, the front end of App Service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can go into another VNet via private link, and then pop out into something called a private link service, which then must go to a standard load balancer, which can then go to a service that you build, or as we've shown in previous videos, an application gateway. What we know as well, the biggest hurdle to using private link is configuring your DNS. And if we boil that down to the most sort of salient point, it's simply because you have FQDNs that normally resolve to public IPs that now you must rework your DNS infrastructure to resolve to these private IPs attached to the NICs that are private endpoints in your VNet. And then to take that one step further, one of the benefits is these private IPs are reachable from on-premises so over your express route of VPN connection. That's one of the big advantages of, of private link versus things like service endpoints. But again, when you do that, the DNS complexity goes up one step further and you have to use conditional forwarders, etc. The demonstration that Adam will show is if you're a Microsoft customer that uses AD integrated DNS, so Active Directory integrated DNS, and you have a domain that spans on-prem and Azure, well, how do you segment out that use of conditional forwarding? So one does not simply deploy DNS. So we have to think about this. We can't just click a button and expect DNS in Azure, DNS on-prem, effectively split horizon DNS for public FQDNs just to work. We have to understand what's going on behind the scenes here. Otherwise, you're gonna get yourself in trouble and you'll find that there'll be outages where people scurry around in troubleshooting tools for days and eventually find out, well, it was DNS. But don't worry, managing DNS is now cool because if you want to use private link, you need to understand DNS. Therefore, therefore, if you're not a network architect, then make sure you make friends with your network architects inside of your company. All right, again, if you want a fast start, there are four URLs that you need to familiarize yourself with. I'll leave them in the description below. But very briefly, the first one, and I would attack them in this order, that's gonna take you to right, I think it's time to get started. a video by the product group, a couple of years old, still the best place to start. That's gonna tee up what is private link as a technology. Next one, why private link? This is written by Federico inside of our CAE team at Microsoft. Brilliant white paper on the context of the different types of PaaS servers that exist and how that maps to the overall network privatization story for PaaS services. Next one, we have a hands-on lab. Yes, this is complex when it comes to DNS and private link. Best thing to do is get hands-on and see how it feels. Deploy into your subscription, simulates on-premises. It does the, the whole stack of using uh, on-premises DNS forwarders. It uses Windows AD integrated DNS. So if you want to use this lab as a basis for following along with Adam's lab later, this will be a great place to start. And then finally, we can't mention private link and DNS without mentioning Daniel Mauser's seminal GitHub repository on the subject around DNS integration scenarios. And in fact, Daniel, I think might be the first person to call out that the use of Active Directory, directory partitions when it comes to DNS are super relevant in this space. He's got a white paper. See this as complementary reading to the demo that Adam is about to lay out. Adam Tuckwell, I'm a cloud solution architect uh, focusing on infrastructure and I work within the Accelerate Swarm team. So the customer in question is quite a traditional customer, currently running a cloud transformation project, which ultimately is the, the exit of the on-premises data centers to Azure. So I've been helping them with the build out of their kind of landing zone design, um, helping them with migration challenges. But they're, they're quite a traditional customer. They use a lot of VMware, a lot of Citrix, a lot of IaaS. 
I use Active Directory, um, obviously ADDS, and I use AD Integrated DNS as part of that, that kind of solution. So what I've kind of tried to just draw out here at a high level is their, their kind of on-prem architecture prior to moving to Azure. I think this is quite common. Um, you've got DCs hosted in two data centers. You've got remote sites with localized DCs, obviously for kind of all fan for DNS forward lookup zone resolution. And then they've also got a number of other sites down here. I think they had around 150 or so remote sites in total. But ultimately in regards to the kind of DNS configuration, they were using a third party DNS provider configured using server level forwarding on their ADDCs within their data centers. Remote sites would use a central DC to gain external resolution. So I think that's that's fairly traditional, something that I come across quite often in customer migration scenarios and the requirement to private endpoint in that kind of hybrid topology. So the, the requirement is, is, is quite basic. Um, so the customer wanted the ability to resolve private endpoints for services like SQL and file storage, um, Key Vault. The, the, the main requirement was around file storage, quite a, a, a standard setup, kind of tried and tested on-premises DNS infrastructure configured with a conditional folder. Um, the conditional folder is for the, the kind of specific zone. So in this instance, in this image, it's database. I think in mine, it's, it's more focused around file.windows.core.net. That then sends on to a DNS forwarder that resides in Azure. That's where you can access the 168 Azure provided DNS special IP, then performs a recursive resolve and passes back the private IP to the, the requesting client. I think a lot of customers are going to be in that hybrid configuration where they've got on-prem resource, they've got the landing zone being built out and they need the ability to access private endpoints in Azure. So what was the problem? The customer and the partner was following standard enterprise scale, Azure landing zone kind of methodology. So building out a kind of platform component identity management connectivity. So as we can see here, um, the customer was looking to build out domain controllers in Azure within the identity subscription. The, the customer in kind of in question was doing some testing within their non-prod environment. And the one thing they'd done was to create uh, a, a few different conditional folders and ultimately tick this box here to replicate the configuration uh, for the conditional forwarder to all DNS servers in the forest. Now, ultimately that meant up here, once the kind of replication kicked in, that replicated that conditional forwarder zone to the DCs in Azure. So initial testing uh, from the customer was successful, but then after a while when replication kicked in and that conditional forwarder zone had replicated to the DC in Azure, um, started causing issues. Ultimately, the conditional forwarder zone was saying send a request for this namespace to this um, next top DNS forwarder in Azure, which is trying to do that to itself once that conditional forwarder zone replicated. There's there's a couple of approaches to help with this. The one I'll focus on is around application partitions, but you can obviously approach this just by creating the conditional forwarder zone manually. Now, when you create a conditional folder, the default is that this box here isn't ticked. So it doesn't force you to replicate that round. That was selected by the customer in this scenario. So you could, if, if you wanted to, just create the conditional folder manually on each DC within your environment. I think that might be sensible for some smaller customers. Um, it's relatively quick to do uh, and not a huge operational overhead, but some customers obviously have a large kind of AD um, integrated estate, so, or AD integrated DNS estate. So doing so for uh, potentially multiple zones, depending on what services they want to resolve, was kind of seen for this particular customer as, as too risky um, and kind of too much operational overhead there. The kind of answer to it is to make use of application partitions. So ultimately what we end up doing, kind of benefiting by, by the use of application partitions is controlling where a conditional forwarder zone is replicated to. We just wanted to um, create the relevant zones but only replicate to domain controllers on-prem. A couple of PowerShell commands and it achieved the objective. Namespaces were only replicated to these. Azure DCs were left alone. Resolution worked as, as kind of required. Just to be clear on, in this configuration, there are a few different ways you can do it, but in this configuration, the DCs hosted in Azure uh, were configured just with server level forward into the 168 address. There are obviously kind of different methods potentially of doing so by if a customer has a, a need or a requirement to use a specific provider for external DNS resolution, then they would have to basically create two separate application partitions, one for their Azure DCs, one for their on-prem DCs, 
and then create separate conditional folders in Azure. In this scenario, and for simplicity, um, this was the, the kind of model that was followed. All, all I've got here, I've tried to kind of um, represent that, that kind of high level topology that I just mentioned. Um, I've created a, a storage account with a private endpoint attached to it. So we're in that kind of scenario of customer wants to um, access an SMB share, obviously using Azure files. I've got um, two on-prem DCs that I'm mimicking here, and I've got two Azure DCs, obviously all part of the same forest. If I have a look at my uh, NS Lookup query to that storage account, and we can see at the moment I'm resolving the public IP address. And we can see that obviously the alias has been updated as required for that private endpoint. Again, this is all documented in, in kind of Dan Mauser's GitHub guide. Um, but ultimately what we're doing here, creating some variables for uh, the app partition. We're defining the domain controllers that we want to be part of that um, app partition. And we're defining the conditional folder zone name that we want to configure. We've set the variables. We just use the um, add DNS server directory partition command lit to create that. Uh, and then we create the zone. And all we're doing really here is defining the DC um, that we want to be part of that uh, conditional folder zone and the partition. So, and, and the key part here, these IP addresses, just for context, these are the domain controllers in Azure. So these are what we're going to be using as that DNS forwarder mechanism. We're going to be sending our requests to that. Ultimately, we should be able to see within DNS Manager. I'll just kick off replication just in the background so you can see that. Uh, on on-prem one, we should see the conditional forwarder zone. The key thing just to, to note as part of that conditional forwarder config for the namespace we've created, you can see that it's added this additional partition in here. So by default, you only have DNS servers in the forest, in the domain, and domain controllers in the um, in this domain for Windows 2000. But you can see here it's added the additional on-prem DNS demo um, app partition, what was created by using the kind of the PowerShell command that's a second ago. And that gives us the ability to control replication for a specific set of DCs for on-prem. We'll see if that has replicated, and it has, which is good. We don't expect it to see that zone on our Azure DCs. As, as required, we've got a uh, conditional folder set up only replicating to on-prem DCs using app partitions. We should now get the resolution of the private IP for that, that private endpoint. Hopefully, that makes sense. And um, I think that was pretty much the end of the, the kind of overview ad.